Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. For the next couple of episodes on Veterans Chronicles, we'll be profiling retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann. Colonel Mann spent 18 years in Special Forces and 15 years as a Green Beret. He also spent many of those years in Afghanistan. In this first part of the profile, we'll bring you our conversation with Colonel Mann from 2019 as we discuss his service to our nation, fighting in Afghanistan, the various missions he had there, and his eerily accurate predictions about what would happen in Afghanistan. Next week, we'll bring you our brand new interview with Colonel Mann about the role he played in the Pineapple Express. That's the mission undertaken by American veterans to rescue our Afghan allies in those final frantic days before the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And now, we begin part one of Colonel Mann's story. Scott Mann was born in Virginia and grew up all over the southeast part of our country as his father worked for the U.S. Forest Service. His father did not serve in the military, but all of his uncles did, as did his grandfather. So the idea of service was instilled in Scott at a very young age. So early, in fact, that he knew he wanted to join the Army and become a Green Beret long before he was old enough to do it. I decided to join, I decided to become a Green Beret when I was 14 years old. Uh, we lived in the little town of Mount Ida, Arkansas, and a Green Beret came into our soda shop. And as soon as I saw this guy, I was like, that's what I'm going to be. And I had no idea what he was. I just, I looked at this guy and he, you know, from the bloused jump boots and the, and the really cool green hat on his head and all the, the medals on, you know, what appeared to be a 28 year old guy. Um, and just the way he carried himself. And I just knew that was me. I could see my way out of that town and, and my future. And as soon as I met him and started talking to him and I learned what special forces do and what makes them so different, I knew that's what I was going to do. And I told my parents at 14. That's I'm going to be a Green Beret. And I think they thought I was kind of crazy because I was about the size of a, you know, like Johnny Appleseed. Uh, and uh, but I did. That's what I ended up doing. Instead of immediately enlisting when he turned 18, Mann decided to pursue his dream in a different way. I decided I wanted to become an officer because I, I talked with this gentleman uh, who was ended up being my mentor all through my career. Uh, Mark. And what he said was like, look, if you want if you want to go into special forces, that's mostly uh, sergeants, you know, who are in special forces. Um, but the officers that are in there, our job is to take care of those guys and to make sure that we give them everything they need to succeed. And there was something about that that really resonated with me. So I went to college at University of Central Arkansas. I got a degree in political science, um, got commissioned as a second lieutenant, and then had to wait five more years before I could even try out to become a Green Beret. They, they don't even consider you until you're a first lieutenant promotable captain. And that's, uh, that's when I went in. So it was, uh, it was literally, if I was 14 when I, when I made my declaration, uh, it was 10 years from that point before I was able to actually put a green beret on my head. It would have been 19, I went to selection and tryouts uh, where you go, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like NFL tryouts or, you know, like a pro sport. You start with four or 500 people and um, they put you through a whole range of individual and team you know, events to see what your, your medal is. And if you're, if you're the right person for them. And that was 1995. It's about a, you know, it's about a year plus process. And I finally graduated in Fort Bragg, North Carolina with my green beret in 1996 in the fall, I believe. The green berets are highly respected in the world of special forces, but man says their approach is a bit different than what most people assume. A lot of folks see special forces in the movies or special ops, and they think immediately, you know, the raid on Osama bin Laden, or they, they, they think of the, the missions where you go in, saving Captain Smith, you know, the kind of the direct action, lethal assault kind of things, right? Sure. And there's a ton of organizations that do that. Green Berets, we're different. We're kind of a combination of Jason Bourne, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and the Verizon guy. <laughs> right. Like we, we, we are relationship based connectors. We go into places. This started in World War Two, where we go behind enemy lines and we work with indigenous people. We speak their language. We live in their culture uh, and we help them stand up on their own from the inside out. Right. So um, for, for me, that was I wanted to do that in Central and South America. That was the area I was most interested in. My first assignment had been to Panama as a lieutenant. So I knew I wanted to go back there, Colombia in particular. This, uh, this guy named Pablo Escobar was running around down there uh, and just all of the stuff that was going on in the Andean Ridge seemed very interesting to me. So they sent me 
Uh, I took the language test for Spanish, did pretty well on it. And they assigned me to 7th Special Forces Group. And within like three days of putting my uh, my green beret on, Greg, I was down at a border outpost between Peru and Ecuador who had just started a small war with each other, you know, that fast. Oh, I was yeah. I was in it. It was fast. And uh, it never stopped after that. Despite that being his first mission, man got plenty of experience, perhaps more than he bargained for. Well, that particular mission, I, did, I hadn't even been assigned. Normally, you're assigned to a 12-man A-team or a 12-person A-team. Um, and the, the A team, not Mr. T in the eighties, like, right. This, this is uh this is a detachment of, of operators who are designed to go behind enemy lines and do just amazing work autonomously. That's what makes us very different as well. So you have two officers on that A team, right? And then you have, uh, a, a weapon sergeant that can assemble and disassemble any weapon in the world blindfolded an engineer sergeant that can build roads, wells, and bridges and blow them up, a medical sergeant that can do everything from a battlefield tracheotomy to pulling an abscess tooth on an elder, and then you have a communications guy who can do computer code or Morse code. And so all those folks go down together. Well, I didn't even get a team. I was sent a solo as an observer down on this demilitarized zone, and uh, that's what I was there to do. They, the, the Ecuadorians and the Peruvians had started a, a war with each other, and they put a few American Green Berets in these outposts living with the officers from these two countries to keep them from killing each other, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So I was a, I was a, truly a peacekeeper, my first mission, uh, and you know, by myself, you know. And that was, a, that was a heck of an experience for a young captain who had never even been in special forces to kind of get thrown into that. But it was, it was definitely drinking from the fire hose. But just like most action involving special forces, Mann says the Green Berets know they are working in places and on missions that will likely get no public acknowledgement. Absolutely. I mean, the, our motto in, in special forces, we call ourselves the quiet professionals. You know, most people don't even know we exist. I mean, other than like the John Wayne movie with the same title, um, you know, The Ballad of the Green Berets by Barry Sadler and, you know, a recent movie starring Thor, <laughs> you know, 12 Strong, like that. People don't really know who we are. We're very quiet about what we do. We go to these remote places, Greg, and we, we, we live there for sometimes six to 12 months at a time, and we have to immerse in the culture and the language. And, and so there's a lot of exposure and risk, not just to us, but to our families. So we're pretty quiet about what we do. And we don't, we don't, make a lot of it public at all. Just a few years after receiving his Green Beret, the 9-11 terrorist attacks struck the United States, and Scott Mann's world immediately changed in many different ways. If you were alive during 9-11 and you were you know, old enough to understand what it was, maybe even if you weren't old, it changed everybody. Um, certainly, it, it changed the military, and I can speak personally, it changed me on a whole on a level I don't think I've ever been through before and probably never will again. Um, and this comes out actually in the play, and we'll talk about that later, but my best friend Cliff, was, uh, who was my ranger buddy um, from D.C., he was killed in the Pentagon on 9-11. And he and I had been through a lot together. We'd, we'd been friends for a very long time. Uh, we both named our firstborn son Cody. Like, we, we were really tight. And uh, when my wife Monty called me and said that um, – you know, that he was dead, it, it, it changed everything for me. And, and all I could think of was payback, was revenge. Everything that I've just told you about special forces and working with the local, all that was gone. It was just, I just wanted to go and take out as many of those people as I could. And I was not alone in that sentiment. But for me, it was very personal. And I spent the next 10 years avenging his death. And hard to say it now, but really going down the wrong road with, with a lot of the stuff that we did. And, uh, so it changed me big time. It changed me big time. And, and, and it's one of those things, you know, when big moments happen in your life and you, it's so big and it's, you're so close to it that you have no clue what you're really doing or going through. It just, you just, you're just riding the wave. And that's what that was. It was just like an emotional, um, roller coaster. And, uh, I think when I came up for air, it felt like it was a decade later. After the attacks, man was chomping at the bit to get in the fight. But it would be another three years before he got to Afghanistan. 
for the special forces community, I mean, you've, if you've seen 12 strong or, you know, red horse soldiers by Doug Stanton, you know, that right after nine 11, you know, there was a decision by president Bush and his administration to respond immediately. So, one of the first organizations to get the call was fifth special forces group out of um, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. There are five special forces groups around the country and, and then two more that are national guard total. There's only 6,500 active duty green berets in the inventory out of like 1.4 million people in the military. So, you know, um, and, where I'm going with this, all of those, those five groups, each group is regionally oriented. Like, so I told you, I went to seventh group. So I spoke Spanish. I worked the Indian Ridge. First group works Asia. Third group works Africa. Tenth group works Europe. Fifth group works the Middle East and Southwest Asia. So they got the nod. They went um, and did an amazing job, frankly, of pushing Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan in less than a, a hundred days with less than a hundred men on horseback. Yeah. And it set the conditions for, you know, um, work in Afghanistan for the long haul. The problem was that we quickly saw it was that the rotations were so depleting on our small force that um, we were going to need more. I wanted to get in the fight so bad I could barely stand it. But, they, you know, they, they kept us focused on Central and South America for the next several years. So I did not get in the fight in Afghanistan uh, until 2004. Okay. And that was my first deployment. And it's like, be careful for what you wish for. Because from that point on, I think I spent enough time in Afghanistan to vote. Uh, you know, it was a long haul after that. Man headed to Afghanistan eager to avenge the death of his good friend and thousands of other Americans. But as he mentioned earlier, the job of the Green Berets is to connect with the indigenous people and build trust and rapport with them. It was not an easy balance. What happened was I, I explained to you kind of that, that vengeance-based approach. Now, that, that's one man's perspective. That was my perspective. There's a lot of Green Berets that say that wasn't the case. But for the most part, as a community, we deployed into Afghanistan, and we were very focused on targeting and interdicting uh, Taliban fighters, uh, senior Taliban and al-Qaeda. We felt like that was what we should be doing. And we kind of moved away from all of the by, with, and through stuff. Um, there was a lot of body count numbers being rendered to congressional parties when they would come to visit. It, it, it you know, it had a feel of, of of an attrition based approach, right? And yeah, we talked about bringing democracy and civil affairs projects out to the rural areas, but it was all top down, Greg. In other words, everything that we were pushing in that country, right, was top down from the Kabul based government and the coalition. Well, the problem is that country in all of its existence, has never functioned in a top-down manner. You know, like, so I, I say where the pavement ends in Afghanistan, uh, which is, you know, only a small portion of that country radiating from the capital, once you step off that pavement, you are, you are in time travel. You are in a land that is, it is ancestral, it is traditional, it is clan-based, honor-based, vengeance feud. You know, it is a status society, uh, very primal and how it operates. And it's been functioning this way for a very long time. Now, Afghanistan is broken over 40 years of war. So both the formal society and the informal society are broken, very damaged. But what we did was we tried to push democracy uh, uh, development, you know, even security from the top, and it was not well received from the residual leaders who were still left over from four decades of war. They didn't trust that government at all that we installed. In fact, many of them that we put in power, looking back now, were warlords that they had been victimized by. So we spent 10 years walking down the Taliban and putting in place development, diplomacy, and security that was not received by the people. And so it became an easy narrative vehicle for the Taliban to strap back into as they reemerged in 2003 from a pretty good shellacking that we gave them. And they started to now fight their own bottom up campaign. And what I tell people is by 2010, you know, we, we started in Kabul. Um, we were just getting to the gates of the villages in 2010. They started in the villages and they were getting to the gates of Kabul. Now you do, you do the math, like it's not a good cocktail. So, um, it was, it was a real problem. By 2009, we looked around 
and we were like, this isn't working, right? There are more Taliban in the rural areas of the country than when we started. Uh, we, we needed a new approach. President Obama was already talking about a, a timed withdrawal, and we're looking at each other like, we missed it. Like, we missed it. We should have been in these villages all along. So at that point, we made a conscious decision at the special operations level to pivot and to get back to our roots. We had several villages that had come to us asking to stand up. And so with my buddy, um, Dr. Seth Jones, formerly from Rand, uh, we came up with this plan hatched in Crystal City at a, at a sports bar in Crystal City to get back into the villages and start working with tribes, kind of a Lawrence of Arabia meets Magnificent Seven kind of thing, get back to our roots. We started with six villages, and that became the village stability program that we started in 2010. And our effort to right the ship of that dichotomy that we had done of, you know, top down instead of bottom up. When we come back on Veterans Chronicles, much more with retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann, a veteran of Special Forces and a Green Beret. I'm Greg Corumbus. Stay with us. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. This week, we are bringing you the first half of our profile of retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Scott Mann, who also served 15 years as a Green Beret. He's the author of Game Changers and Mission America and the play Last Out, which is designed to help veterans struggling after their service. Next week, we will hear him describe the harrowing Pineapple Express that he was a big part of, that, of course, was the effort to rescue our Afghan allies from the Taliban in the last couple of weeks of August 2021. Before the break, Colonel Mann was explaining how in 2010, the military finally started engaging the Afghan people where they lived and sought to build trust with them. But that's easier said than done. How do you build trust after the people haven't trusted you for almost a decade? Mann says it wasn't easy, but it was possible. And the program actually became a huge success. Yeah. So what I talk about in my book, there were really, there was a couple of game changing principles that we follow. One is meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. You know, that same stuff you kind of learn in kindergarten. If you want to mobilize people to stand up, which is what Green Berets do, you got to meet them where they are. And that meant we had to leave, we had to live in the villages. We had to live and endure what they were going through, which we did. So we, we moved into the communities. Then you have to start understanding What's their journey? What what are their sources of instability? What do they care about? What's keeping them up at night? And what we found was it was none of the stuff that we were trying to project from Kabul, right? They were worried about food insecurity. They were worried about conflict resolution. They were worried about land management, resource management. They were worried about water. You know, the same stuff that we worry about at a primal visceral level when you're when you're living in austere circumstances. So we needed to get clear on that. We needed to get clear on their history. How did they typically resolve uh, conflicts? How did they feel about tribal dynamics? You know, which tribal feuds were still going? We weren't paying attention to any of that. Right. We were driving by these villages, tossing out soccer balls on the way and putting people's thumbprints in black ink to say they voted. Right. And we weren't looking at the real micro grievances that were going on in these areas. Once we started working those. And by the way, Green Berets are great at that if you just turn them loose. Right. Uh, Once we started doing that and they started connecting around those issues, it flipped, it changed. And you started to see these little teams of 12 turning into fighting forces of 1200 where entire communities were now standing up within a couple of weeks. I actually started calling that rooftop leadership because you'd see a village would be under duress in an attack and there'd be 12 Green Berets up there on the rooftop fighting, all the Afghans down below. A week later, there'd be a couple of farmers up on their rooftop fighting back alongside. And then by the end of a month, every rooftop in that community is like pouring rifle fire into the source of the attack, breaking it off the way they've done for centuries. But it took, you know, it took a little bit of time. It took relationship building, meeting people where they are. Um, Describe you, what that means, meeting them where so, they are. So how, like, do you, how do you connect with them to the point where they're willing to stand beside you? and? Yeah, so that's that you connect old school interpersonal skills. We had to get back to our roots, like sitting down in a shura with elders, asking thoughtful, open ended questions, listening to what they're telling you. Right. Storytelling back and forth to make connections and then backing up what you say you're going to do through action and deed. Right. And, and it was just a lot of just interpersonal skills and building rapport at a real powerful level and then demonstrating your commitment to that relationship by how you defended the community from the inside, 
not rolling in in the middle of the night to pull someone out of their home, but rather to run up the ladder of a home you're staying in in that village to help protect that community. That's a whole different thing, you know, uh, much harder. But but the reciprocity that came from that, Greg, was exponentially higher. And that's when we started to see a true movement occur. And in 18 months, we went from six villages to 113 villages. I've never seen anything like it in my career. And I think had we stayed the course um, over the next 10 years or so, we could have had a pretty good chance at stabilizing those rural areas. Part of that great success was having a clear, consistent narrative or message about who we were, why we were there, and what we wanted to achieve. Mann says that messaging was critical since the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and other radicals had been effective at their messaging for a very long time. One of my other game changers is tell a story that sticks, right? We are story animals. We've been telling stories for 100,000 years. doesn't matter if you're in the Beltway or if you're in Baluchistan. We tell stories. Our brain is wired to process information in story. We operate in narrative. Yet when we do things like Operation Enduring Freedom, we don't even understand or consider what the pre-existing narrative is that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda are using, or nowadays ISIS. We don't pay attention to it. We don't understand the resonance that it has with folks in that part of the world and right here at home. So it starts with that. You've got it. What's the story already being told? Well, it starts with, do I value story at a macro level? And I, th I don't think we do. I think our politicians, our policymakers, and our senior leaders lack the appreciation for story and narrative that they need to have. Two is what is the story already being told? And then three, what's my story? What is the story that we're going to tell that will hopefully compete and outcompete that pre existing narrative? That's the challenge. And almost no one does that these days. But the ones that do, they have the best chance of moving people to action. But there was another challenge. How do you get Afghan tribes that have hated each other for centuries to start working together toward common goals? That's in and out group behavior. Once again, humans, we're all primal creatures, right? And when things get real in life, we get primal. And so we form in and out groups and we've been doing it. It happens, it happens in this building, right? People at Christmas parties will form into their own little in and out groups. Uh, that's fine until resources start to get scarce and honor is at stake. Now you have tribal feuds. So what we would do is we would form relationships with each of these tribes. And then there's a lot of precedent in status society, tribal society, for third parties to broker peace. Uh, so we would use, our, they would, we would bring them around the table and connect them, not because they trusted each other, but they trusted us. So we would be intermediaries, and over time, we would build a relationship, would help them build a relationship back with each other. Sometimes it's around water, sometimes it's a pre existing feud. We would help them with conflict resolution, or we would bring in a resilient actor who could. Same thing in the country here today for folks listening to this. If you want to be a relevant leader today, be that person that can restore relationships uh, in, the, in the people around you because that kind of in-group, out-group behavior happens all the time. And we're starving for leaders who can come in, see the gap, and restore those relationships. You know, restorative leadership is huge, and that's what we would practice. When we come back, we'll go deeper into what worked in Afghanistan, what didn't, and what Scott Mann could see coming two years in advance. We'll also discuss his efforts to help veterans after their service days are done. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is part one of our two-part profile of retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel and Green Beret Scott Mann. He's the author of Game Changers and Mission America, and the play Last Out. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But first, some of Scott Mann's thoughts on our Afghan policy as he saw them at the time of this conversation back in 2019. Despite nearly two decades of struggle there, Mann was not at all optimistic. I would love to tell you that we figured it out, we learned from our lessons, and we're, but we, I don't think we have. I think if you look at what's going on in Syria, um, I think if you look at how we've, we're pulling out of Afghanistan, how we pulled out of Iraq, you know, I don't think we've learned the lesson. Now I'm talking in particular about how we fight violent extremism and how we deal with the locals who are at risk in those sanctuary areas. Because if we're going to defeat violent extremism, I believe we have to mobilize the locals who live in those sanctuary areas to be an antibody to that extremism. The same way in a gang infested neighborhood until the citizens 
are a resilient antibody to that outside external actor or that bad actor, you're going to have a problem. So I don't believe that we've truly learned our lessons. And that bothers me because my oldest son is about to go fight the war I didn't finish. Unfortunately, with the same strategy that we had. I don't think we've I don't think our politicians have learned from it. I don't think our senior leaders have learned policymakers. And I'll tell you why, because I don't think they're deep enough on the problem. I think they thin slice on everything. And, and, and so they think they can fling the seals at a problem or the Marines and that we can attrit our way through it. And we can't. And, or they try to win it on one watch like this administration is going to win the war on terror. That's not going to happen. These are generational fights because the narrative that we're going against has existed for centuries, right? And so it's like turning the battleship around in the ocean with a canoe paddle. It's going to take immense patience on the part of our nation. And our leaders need to get deeper on this so that the narrative they tell, we tell our own people, that we can help them understand that this is going to take time to do this. Um, so I don't think we've learned our lesson. I look at the way we're treating a lot of the locals, Greg, and places where we go in and say, we're going to work with you. We're going to help you. And then we turn around and we leave and they're slaughtered, you know, and the, you know, retribution is severe. And, and that tells me that we, we still haven't figured it out. So we, I think we have a lot of work to do if we're going, ISIS isn't done yet. They're not that, that yes, they've been defeated on the battlefield, but I guarantee you they're going to get themselves back together and they will reemerge. And until we figure out how to outcompete with their narrative and how to mobilize locals in the areas where they set up shop, they're going to carry the day. Another challenge he saw during his years in Afghanistan, and more recently, was the relentless determination of the Taliban and Afghan tribes. He pointed out they've been fighting for many years, and they're ready to fight a whole lot longer. These are hardcore locals, right? They're fighting for their soil. They're fighting for their community. They're fighting for what they believe is their way of life. And, you know, the thing to remember about a place like Afghanistan or a place like Syria or, or you know, North Africa, you're going to if you're fighting locals, which is what the Taliban are for the most part, you're fighting with people who have who have hit outsiders from the same ambush site. They've passed that thing down like we passed down our grandfather's pocket watch. Right. They they passed down a family ambush site. Like they, a particular piece of terrain that is perfect for, you know, an outside army to move through and be ambushed from. I've seen it. So I've, I've gone on walking tours with elders who have proudly shown me a turn in the road that they hand down to their grandchildren. Right. Because they and, 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 you know, they call Afghanistan the graveyard of empires for a reason. Right. I mean, they they absolutely the one thing that will unify an Afghan clan population is an outsider. There's a saying that says me against my brother, my brother and me against my cousin, my brother and me and my cousin against the world. And it's a very, very true thing. They will rally uh, in a heartbeat around an outside threat. And they're very good. After leaving the military, it didn't take Scott Mann long to find his next mission. That's because within days, he started struggling mightily as he tried to adjust to civilian life. And he then learned many other veterans were having that same struggle. Yeah, so when I transitioned out of the military about six years ago, I had I retired. I thought I had everything set up. I had my plan, my retirement plan. I was going to do some real estate, write my book, hang out with my kids. My wife and I still had our relationship. My wife, Monty, our three boys were still at home. And it was about 72 hours after retiring, Greg, that like, you know, putting those Florida flip flops on that the snakes in my head started squirming around as one of my mentors, Dave Phillips, a fifth group special forces guy from Vietnam says it was it, like I, I honestly felt like I had changed planets uh, there. It was such a different place that I was in. I, you know, I felt just disconnected and, and it was really quick that I felt that I couldn't get my head around it. But the emotions were up and down. I was extremely moody, making good money, doing everything on the surface, had a job. But but inside, I just felt like I was on a, a stormy sea and I couldn't, no one could connect to me. And I couldn't really connect to anyone, including my family. My kids walked around on eggshells and that was my life for two years. Uh, and it was only through a couple of mentors, civilian mentors, who were working with me on different things. They noticed that I like to tell stories and be on the stage. They were storytellers. And they started showing me how storytelling can be used as a cathartic way to find your way back to your purpose, to talk about your own hero's journey, what you've been through. And I started finding that a lot of folks were interested 
in my journey and what the, the, the lessons of my brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and what they had learned in working with tribes and even corporations liked hearing about storytelling and human connection. And so I started using story to bridge the gap and I became a student of story. And, and now today, that's all I do is I'm a storyteller and connection coach. And what I've learned is that storytelling is cathartic. It helps us bridge the worlds of, of differences that are out there. And we've been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years. So story literally saved my life. And so I started working with other veterans on coming home and, and using story. And the, the book you're talking about, a friend of mine was um, about to kill himself. And uh, this was a different gentleman than that's in the book. And it bothered, I talked him off the ledge literally, but it bothered me so bad. My wife, Monty, was like, you should write because she knows me. And so I started writing and like 120 pages later, what I thought was going to be a blog post, I decided to self-publish and call it Mission America, straight talk about military transition. And it's really was just my journey about the things that I've told you I just went through mm -hmm. so that we could get this in the hands pr primarily of our active duty members you know, that are like a one year out so that they can read about what's coming and, and know that you're not crazy. You're not, there's nothing wrong with you. What you're going through is normal. You're probably disconnected from your purpose. You probably left that in the team room. You know, you probably need to find the next ridge line that you're walking. Like there's, you know, there's going to be snakes in the head, you know, that are going to, they're going to kind of mess you up emotionally just because you're going to miss your family, your tribe. Mm -hmm. And so I put all that in that book and we've given away 13,000 of those. Uh, and we formed a nonprofit around it, Greg, called The Hero's Journey. And so our focus primarily is on helping warriors and their families find their voice, how to fully express themselves outside the military, and tell their story as they come home. Colonel Mann says the response has been great, but it often takes a while for veterans to feel comfortable putting their story together and expressing it. But he says once they do it, it does a world of good for them and their families. So remember that whole quiet professional thing we talked about? Yeah. So turns out most of the military is conditioned to think that way. And are, as are the military family, the children, the spouses, we don't talk about ourselves. We, you know, we, we just do our job and, and we love what we do for the most part. We feel purposeful. But then when you get out, you know, that whole quiet professional thing is not exactly advantageous to the civilian world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a liability. And so when I, the first thing I do when I talk to veterans is I'm like, you know, I want you to learn how to craft and tell your story. And they're like, you know, they pull back from that because that that's not comfortable. But then I start to explain to them, first of all, every society on the planet has used stories for centuries mm -hmm. to integrate and assimilate veterans back home. Tribal societies around the world still do it. We're about the only country on the world in the world that doesn't use actively storytelling. I mean, look at what you guys are doing. I mean, that's what you're doing effectively right. is you are using storytelling to heal, inform and educate from the experiences of veterans. And that's what we should be doing. And so and then I talk about the science and power of story. And, I, you know, I'm a businessman. I can say, like, I, I teach, you know, Fortune 100 executives on guess what? What you did in combat and the power of story. And so if you can learn to tell your story, you can relate to them, your journey, your miles, your scars and how you're of value. Then they start to soften up, and then we start going through the development of their hero's journey, of what they went through, the struggle, how they overcame it, what was resolved, and what they learned. And it's the most cathartic, amazing thing to watch, Greg. It really is. It's it's so it's us. It's hard because they hold back, and uh, that's really why we did the play. Is because I wanted to show from the stage the power of story and to to soften up the armor of so many of our veterans and family members who just, you know, right now they're isolated. Mann says his work is designed to help military families understand what their veterans have gone through, but also to help the veterans understand what their spouses and children endured while they were gone. It's an issue that hits very close to home for him. When we do the play, a lot of people come up, couples, they come up afterwards and the, you, you know they're about to have a different conversation on the way home because the play brings up things from both worlds. Because as warriors, we don't realize what our spouses go through. We don't realize what our kids go through. I mean, I remember when I retired six years ago, my oldest son, Cooper, who's in D.C. with me this week, he just graduated high school. He wants to be an FBI officer or agent. Um, you know, he was only 13 when I was when I retired, and I was getting ready to walk out into the retirement ceremony. Like, we're literally seconds from walking out. He comes and he's like, can I talk to you? I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And he just, I was like, sure. And so we go off and he said, are you done? And I said, yeah, Coop, I'm done. That's what I'm standing here for. And he's like, no, you tell me you're done. 
And I said, I'm done. And he just lost it. And he just hugged me and, and just sobbed. And, you know, this kid had been carrying around this pain of, is my dad going to come home for his entire life? And he just wanted to know that he could let that go, you know, and, and I had no clue. You talk about father of the year, right? Um, we just don't understand what, what it is that our family members endure and they don't necessarily know what happens with us. So I am, my mission for the rest of my life is to help close that gap and using story to do it. And I think we got to talk to each other. We got to, we got to use story to communicate that. Cause otherwise what happens is you push it down, you form your, your own perceptions and that's very dangerous. He also explained how his storytelling ended up becoming a nationwide stage production called Last Out. So I'm a, you know, I'm a speaker. I speak for profit around the world, nonprofit, and I, 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 do, I take acting classes to do that because I'm a storyteller on stage. I really try to own the room and be very physically present. And several of my coaches uh, are actors and they've written one person plays and they kept putting me in these little one man shows. They would have me write something and and I think they knew what they were doing way before I did, which is not pretty much the story of my life. Um, but they, they, I would do a story from the war. And like the, what started it all was this, this little green silly band. My youngest son, Braden, gave me this before I deployed on a deployment. And he said, this is a magic silly band. And this will keep you safe while you're over there, but you can't ever take it off. So I went through all kinds of stuff wearing the silly band where senior officers tried to get me to take it off and I wouldn't take it off. So I did a one person show five minutes on this silly band as the silly band. And I talked about making my way back to Braden, you know, and how my owner wouldn't take it off. And when I was done, like everybody was weeping and they were like, that's a play. So we started building a play around a silly band, you know, and um, two years later we had um what, what all of my coaches said, and I, and here's the other thing too, and this is what I believe is when you do work that's bigger than you, right. And you're just the vessel, people will come to your aid in ways that you can't even imagine. Uh, I had the, one of the writers for last of the Mohicans heard about what I was doing and he started coaching me. I mean, can you, I mean, I'm not worthy of that, but I've never written anything like this, but he did. And, and the play really started to come together. So two years later, we had something, we did a reading and it, everybody was like, wow. And so then we went to, we were like, my next thing was, I want to play the role of Danny because it's such a heavy role. Um, and then I want to have an all veteran cast. And so we started casting it. And yeah, I mean, and then it's just been, I just trying to hang on and just, it's like a, it's like a Bronco just trying to hang on. The COVID-19 pandemic brought the tour of Last Out to a halt. However, it will soon be a movie, available on Veterans Day 2021. The proceeds will be used to help our Afghan allies assimilate here in the United States. For more information, go to lastoutplay.com. Scott Mann was very closely involved in the rescue of hundreds of our Afghan allies in the weeks surrounding the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. And in part two of our profile, Scott will take us into the Pineapple Express and how our veterans banded together to rescue their friends when the Taliban rolled in and started to control Kabul. I'm Greg Columbus. Don't miss that part of the story right here on Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.